Good evening. So um, tonight we're going to review part of chapter eight in the foundation book. And we'll start with our motivation. Uh, this chapter is about precious human life, and I found that um, by spending so much time with this, it's been quite good for my mind. And now that we're doing the Tara retreat between the two, it makes my mind feel very buoyant. And then I was thinking about um, this verse that we have written on our wall downstairs by uh, Shantakirti. And it kind of encapsulates the three principal aspects of the path. So when we think of our precious human life, what is it for? How do we want to use it? What's the point? And this verse says, like a water wheel in motion, migrators have no autonomy. First with thought I, they cling to a self. Then with a thought mine, they become attached to things. I bow to this compassion that cares for my greeters. So in this verse, we see the need to free ourselves from cyclic existence. And we see the difficulty of uh, why we need wisdom due to clinging, to clinging attachment and the ignorance underneath it. And we also see the bodhicitta, which arises from compassion. And compassion underlies the whole path. So as we um, review um, the Precious Human Life teachings tonight, let's keep in mind what our motivation is. the direction we're taking in our life, and the purpose. May we follow this path to full awakening and have uh, the ability to help beings to free themselves from cyclic existence, to have happiness, to be free of suffering. So may that be our motivation. So as I was looking at this chapter, it became very clear to me, both in this chapter and the other things I read to kind of inspire myself more, that I need to spend more time with this topic. And so I have been, and it's quite nice. It feels like instead of kind of the mind thinking about what I don't have, <laughs> I've just been thinking about what I do have. <laughs> So, you know, day after day after day that I've been thinking about this. And so maybe that's why it makes my mind more buoyant. Um, in, the, in the outline in the Lam Rim on this topic, they, this comes um, after the stages of how to train your mind after you've relied on a teacher. The first thing in this topic of a precious human life is an exhortation. So they're going to like kind of try to get you motivated. So I decided to um, use uh, um, both His Holiness and Venerable Children as well as Pacho Rinpoche because he usually does a pretty good job of saying things in a really beautiful way. Um, so His Holiness talks about the need for us to develop self-confidence and appreciation of our potential and that this is the main purpose that why we contemplate this topic. So this kind of confidence, self-confidence and appreciation of our potential as uh, human beings with this precious human life. And so over time, if we continue with this meditation, a sense of conviction will arise that can definitely transform our minds and that will allow spiritual realizations to grow. 
So we need to recognize the potential that we have. And if we don't, we might spend a lot of time instead complaining, being upset about events in the world or close to home, personally global. So we would, you know, spend our time constantly focusing on our misfortune and then we wouldn't see all the good in the world. And that's a very narrow and unrealistic vision of our of our life and it doesn't lead to our well-being and it won't inspire us. Whereas if we contemplate a precious human life, it will actually help us to be inspired in our practice. Then, um, so Pato Rinpoche had this interesting <laughs> phrase where, you know, it's, it's the eight, there are 18 conditions that we have the eight freedoms and the ten fortunes. There's different translations of them, so there's 18. And the first ones are the eight freedoms or eight leisures or whatever. And he calls these the most valuable leisure. (laughs) I thought, well, that's an interesting thing because we like leisure. So, But this is the most valuable leisure that we have. And I wanted to share his long exhortation, his long... uh, I find his words inspiring and insightful. Sometimes the language is a little different from ours, um, but and it is a little long, but I, I thought it was pretty helpful. And he says, in general, people these days harbor great hope of the merciful help of the guru while they continue to engage in irreligious activities. They think that they will not suffer the results of their dematorious deeds, their unwholesome actions, because of the grace of the guru can transport them to liberation as easily as the flinging of a stone. So we might not have that particular slant on this, but we have our, I think we have our own where we sometimes may, even as Buddhists being raised in the culture we are raised in, we might have the idea of an all-powerful God that's kind of underneath there subliminally subliminally, and thinking we're going to be like transported to salvation somehow. Or we might see the teacher as like a parent figure and think they're going to rescue us from harm. I think that might be the two directions we might go because of the culture we're raised in. But I like the way he clarified this. He says, what is called being held by the Guru's grace is this. The teacher leads you with her compassionate grace. They teach you the profound teachings. They open your eyes to what to discern, to discern what is what you're to adopt and what to, you're to abandon. And they show you the path to liberation, all in conformity with the teachings of the Buddha. Apart from that, there is no additional grace. So basically, depending on that, what he just laid out, it's actually up to us whether we travel the path or not. So you know, sometimes we can, you know, want more from a teacher than is really their role, but he makes it very clear what to adopt, what to abandon, they guide us in that way. So he continues, on this occasion, you have obtained a state of a human being with leisure and endowment, which is like the freedoms and the fortunes. You know the technique for acquiring virtue and abandoning vice, is his word. At this time, the power of decision is in your hand. This very moment is the dividing line between your making a good or bad choice. Therefore, follow the exact instructions of the spiritual mentor. It is important that you settle the question of samsara and nirvana. And that was puzzling to me. What does that mean, settle the question of samsara and nirvana? And he goes on to explain it. It's a kind of a twofold explanation. He says it starts with our attitude towards our practice. We know these, but they call them four assumptions in his text. Assume yourself to be the patient. Assume the Dharma to be the medicine. Assume the spiritual teacher to be the skilled physician. And assume constant practice to be the treatment that will certainly cure the disease. So from that perspective, you can see that we're like at a crossroads. We can either go up or down in samsara. And he says it's like turning a horse by its bridle. I don't know if you've ever ridden a horse, but 
it's like we get to control that. We're going to go up or down in samsara. And it's this very occasion that we're alive where we have the power to do that. And he goes on to explain that the human state is actually, the, um, it, um, if we do uh, virtuous actions, it's actually um, more effective in creating virtue than any other state that we could be in. So we need to take care that we don't waste this life. But also, for we could also accumulate unwholesome deeds that lead us downwards, and we're also more capable of that too than any other sentient being. So we have the opportunity to create the causes for, um, I think what he says is, uh, settle the question of samsara and nirvana. What direction? How do we want our life to go? Now is the time when you have met a guru who is like an expert doctor, found the noble dharma, which is the medicine that restores you to life. Thus now you must make these four sublime assumptions, being a uh, patient and all that. Take the road to freedom and put into practice the dharma that you have heard. So I I find his explanation to be very uh, helpful, very clarifying, like the role of the teacher, uh, the perspective we want to take on our life, and especially the thing about these four assumptions, I think that's the attitude until we reach Buddhahood that we need to have. So it's the case is that we have a human life, but not every human life is a precious human life. There's a lot of conditions that need to be present in order to have a precious human life that allows us to use our life in a meaningful way. And so um, the purpose of meditating on these different conditions is so that we'll understand deeply the difficulty of having these conditions. So the first is the contemplation about leisure or the eight freedoms, eight impediments, I think is what Venerable calls them. And we're free of these eight impediments. We have these eight freedoms, these eight types of leisure. So in this context, leisure means that we're not born in an inopportune state, a state that doesn't permit us to um, practice the Buddha Dharma. So basically, in, in these eight states, there's actually no time to practice the Dharma. That's what he said. What, um, yeah kind of blending their teachings on this a little bit. So His Holiness recommends that when we think about these, what we really want to do is don't just think about other people or other beings who are in these states. Actually, imagine living in these circumstances. So I would invite you, uh, especially the people here, I'm happy to give you my notes if you just want to listen and just really think about you know, imagine the circumstances that we're talking about, um, whatever you want to do. So if you want to contemplate imagining being in these circumstances, if you were in them, what it would be like, and then recall that you don't have that. We're, we're free of these. So that leads us to have a kind of appreciation. So... Of the eight, the first, their group, there's two groups, the first four and the second four. The first four are rebirth in non-human states. And these are, although our rebirths are temporary, th- these states don't allow us, at least for the duration of those states, we cannot practice the Dharma. And these four non-human states are hell beings, pretas or hungry ghosts, animals, and long-lived gods. Long live gods are the discriminationless gods. I actually prefer to say free from discrimination because that discriminationless is too long for me. Uh, so long live gods is maybe easier. And that's the gods who are in the um, fourth <coughs> form realm, the fourth Diana of the form realm. So if you were born as a, hunk, as a hell being, you would have no opportunity to practice the Dharma because you would always be suffering from pain of heat and cold. If you were born as a preta, 
you'd have no opportuni opportunity to follow the Dharma because you'd constantly be occupied with sufferings of hunger and thirst. Animals also can't practice the Dharma because they suffer from being exploited and from harming each other. And the long-lived gods have no opportunity to practice the Dharma because they pass their time in a freight of state that is free from discrimination, <laughs> discriminationless. <laughs> so in that, in that dhyana, that meditative stabilization, there's, uh, they don't discriminate virtue and non-virtue. And, but they do regard this state as, as liberation, as the ultimate liberation. And so they can enjoy this uh, state of mind, this situation for many great eons. But when that karma ends, the karma that brought them up to that God realm is exhausted. Because they were believing this was liberation, they see it isn't at that point. And it's just like, it's just they let go of their belief, actually, in liberation, potentially. It causes a kind of antagonism or anger that just shoots them down to the hell realm. That's a possibility. Pacha Rinpoche, that's what his take. So we don't have that. And we want to, when we train in meditative stabilization, we need to be careful about that. In fact, there's a, in the Pali Canon, there's a sutta where the Buddha met this young king who had attained some of these states. And then he was, go, gave up his kingship, I think, and was going to meet the Buddha. I think as it goes, the Buddha met him in a potter's shed. And he didn't know it was the Buddha, but he convinced him to let go of this. Um, he really liked these states of mind, and he helped him to see that, that that wasn't the end game, and he needed to go beyond that. And it's lucky he did, because I, I can't remember if he... He died soon after that, I believe. I didn't read that part of the sutra. I think I didn't finish the teaching on this. I think I was listening to Bhikkhu Bodhi teach about this, maybe. Anyway, he... he um, he finally did realize he was with the Buddha and he kind of worked out that, oh, he needed to do more, but I'm not sure how far along he got, but he did, he did die pretty soon after that. And I think that's why the Buddha went to meet him so that he wouldn't end up in some bad situation like one of these long-lived gods. So maybe he did get some level of uh, wisdom and you know, stream, I don't know where he ended up. So those are the four non-human states. We also, as with oppression to human life, we're also free from four disadvantageous human conditions. So there, these four, you're a human, but you're born, say, like in a border region, what they call a barbarian region. Or you're born in periods where there aren't any Buddhas. You're kind of in between Buddhas. <laughs> or you're one who has... <laughs> yeah, in, in the in between bardo, <laughs> or you have deficient uh, faculties, or you hold wrong views. You know, so these eight have no leisure. And why is that? So if you were born in a border region, this kind of country or region or whatever, there's actually no opportunity to practice the Dharma there because there is no Buddhism there. It's either outlawed or maybe it's a place where the people there are following their ancestral traditions and they may have practices and behaviors that are actually quite contrary to the Dharma. I can, I remember when I was a kid, I was so interested in the Incas, but I'm, I know they had human sacrifice and I don't know what, I don't know much about their beliefs. I just was fascinated with them. So I could have, you know, if I was born there, the likelihood of, Knowing anything about the Dharma would be pretty slim. So, the, uh, let's see, then born in a period devoid of Buddhas. So that's a time when the Dharma hasn't been taught. They call that a dark eon. You won't even hear the words or the sounds, three jewels. You'll have no idea of what the Dharma is. The Buddha Dharma. And because of this, you likely won't be able to distinguish virtue from vice. And I think about that just in my own life. Like when I became, uh, when I started uh, 
not being a closet Buddhist who just read books at home, but in 2000 when I went to um, the Sakya Monastery and Dharma Friendship Foundation, both places were teaching the ten non-virtues. And so I spent like the first year and a half of my practice thinking about those every day. And this really made me think of that, being able to distinguish virtue from non-virtue, because the whole level of confusion left my mind by focusing on those. I just, you know, like in our culture, there's so many things that are non-virtuous that are just kind of the way things are done. And I was definitely a part of that. So anyway, if you're born in a period, you know, that's devoid of Buddhas, there's going to be no opportunity to practice the Dharma. And then if you were born with deficient faculties, like being severely mentally or physically impaired, then your ability to learn is going to be so restricted, extremely restricted. I've met people like this in my life. I remember when I was in graduate school, I was taking a class in adapted physical therapy. And I met, I worked with this little infant. I don't even know how old this child was. He was, I don't know, it's hard to say, maybe two. He didn't have any speech. He couldn't walk. He couldn't talk. He was on like a board thing that they kind of moved around on. And I was working with him. I remember I was in a room that had like a a universal gym, these weight training machines. And I remember uh, it was just me and him in that room. I don't remember the whole situation about this. I was in graduate school. And I remember that um, I remember touching him, like massaging him a little bit to make this kind of connection and looking in his eyes. And I knew that we had this, that he, there was like a connection there. But he had no, he was never going to learn how to speak, to talk, to walk. I mean, he was just, there was like a spark in his eyes, but that was going to be it. And I also remember meeting a kid once when I was doing my physical therapy training uh, at this place at the University of Washington where they have an experimental education unit. And this girl was 16 using a walker and she had no cerebral cortex. She actually, they were really shocked that she lived so long and her mother looked completely worn out. That's what I really remember. And I also remember with her, you know, like she couldn't talk that I can recall. She could walk with a walker. I don't remember a lot of details, uh, but I remember the connection, like, and I talked with Sister uh, Nancy about this. She had some of these experiences too. And I realized that the good heart is there. There's something about the good heart was there in both of those. Um, But they actually, both of those individuals in this life would never be able to practice the Dharma. They would never be able to understand it. They just not physically or mentally able. So if your consciousness isn't serviceable like that, you'll never be able to understand the words or the meaning of the words. So that's the seventh of the eighth. And the last one is holding wrong views. So these, if we hold wrong views, that makes our mind essentially unreceptive. And His Holiness says we won't really examine the Buddhist explanations of the Four Noble Truths. We won't think about dukkha, its causes, its cessation, and the path that lead to cessation. Our mind actually won't be open to actually understanding that. And that's the kind of like the elephant's footprint that all the Buddhist teachings fall into. You know, the elephant has the largest footprint, and all the Buddhist teachings are contained, you know, relate to the Four Noble Truths. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't be receptive to that if you have wrong views that are maybe instinctual or however, they, however you got them. It's also said that um, if people hold contrary views, like if they have like a, um, more like a, I guess these would be acquired views, that promote like eternalism or nihilism, that would make the mind have a difficult time to really be receptive to Buddhism. 
And so then with this kind of situation, there wouldn't be any opportunity to practice the Dharma because your mind is preoccupied with these thoughts that are contrary to the Dharma. So those, though, that wouldn't be a, a suitable condition to be able to be receptive to the Dharma. And then it's also said that um, if you hold views that are antagonistic to the Dharma and its followers, you won't have the opportunity. And this is the story. I, I remember hearing about uh, somebody being reborn in a garden as a hungry ghost. Do you remember hearing about that? I remember hearing about that. I never knew what it was. <laughs> there, uh, Sunak Satra is the Sanskrit name. In Tibetan, it's like pay karma. He was a monk and he served the Buddha <laughs> for 25 years. But he didn't have the slightest faith in him. In fact, he was quite, uh, he regarded the Buddha with scorn. And he was reborn in a garden as a hungry ghost. I think actually he, he got that, he worked out that karma, but and things went better for him after that. But that's uh, maybe um, kind of an, a situation where the mind is kind of antagonistic to the Dharma or its followers and that wouldn't really be a good situation. So we need to guard ourselves from these kind of things. And recall that the reason that we have a precious human life is that it has causes. And the causes are that we keep the pure ethics, we abandon the 10 destructive actions, these 10 pathways of action, and we practice the six far-reaching attitudes, the paramitas. And we make pure prayers to be reborn in a precious human rebirth and to be able to practice the Dharma. And Venerable Children says also to meet qualified Mahayana and Vajrayana teachers. But th those first part, that's, those are the causes of a precious human rebirth. So, and then um, we have the 10 endowments or 10 fortunes, 10 opportunities. So these are split into two groups. And the first five are things that are found within ourselves. They're um, aspects of opportunity that pertain to ourself, what Venable calls, or His Holiness calls, five personal fortunes. And the other five are endowments that um, relate to others, that rest with others. They, the opportunity pertains to others. So um, these may come from, or be fortunate factors that come from society, for example. So His Holiness gives us some advice about how to approach this topic. And he says that we should reflect on these each individually and see that we have this advantageous situation and all the necessary conditions for serious practice and let this gladden the mind. And so I think that's the, you know, the one thing we need to take the time to do this. I think that's why, you know, just... I didn't you know, spend a lot of time with this, but I kind of routinely went back to this topic over the last maybe two and a half weeks. And it really does gladden the mind and it kind of just puts a perspective on things. And to really have this be something that gave, really can propel us with a lot of enthusiasm and increase our self-confidence. I think if we continue it, um, he, His Holiness says that will happen. So I take him at his word. So the first five endowments, or the first five personal fortunes, I kind of like endowments, freedoms and fortunes, freedoms and fortunes, or fortunes, yeah. Um, these are called this because they are included within our mind stream. They are fabled conditions that we have to practice the Dharma. And I did continue, I did uh, this, preparation with our text, but I also, uh, there's actually a lot more written in Pacho Rinpoche's book on Precious Human Life, so I, I really wanted to, I wanted to read stories, so I, I read a lot in that book. I don't, I'm not teaching on that because it was all too long, but I, I wanted to read stories, so there was just more there. And it turns out when they do this, this topic, that um, uh, Sankapa and his Holiness book that we're studying, they take this list of the first five from the Sh Shravaka Bhumi, the Shravaka levels, so which is a sutra. Um, but 
Patra Rinpoche takes them from Nagarjuna. So I'm going to kind of contrast these as we go through. The first three are pretty much the same, and the last two are, are slightly different. So uh, in the Shravaka Bhumi Sutras, the first five of these endowments are being human, being born in a central region, having complete sensory and mental faculties, having reversible karma, and having faith in the source. And in Nagarjuna, the first two are the kind of the same, to be born human being, to be born in a central country with perfect faculties. And the fourth one they call engage in a proper vocation, which is where I think that's the most different. And the last one is having faith in the abode of the Dharma, which is quite similar. So the first one is to be born a human being. If we don't have a human state, we won't meet the Dharma. So that having a human body is a favorable endowment. So it's said that divine beings are supposed to have the best physical status. You know, they don't have uh, the problems that we have as, with our human bodies. But their systems are actually unsuitable to, uh, for receiving the Pratimoksha precepts. In fact, when we take our vows, there's a part where we ask, are you a non-human being? And that refers to gods or spirits who can change form and come to an ordination. I think that's what it's referring to. Um, so these beings, they actually can't, they might be able to meet the Buddha Dharma, but they can't meet it in its entirety because they cannot um, ordain as monastics. So that's not advantageous. So being born uh, a human being with human intelligence, that allows us to um, reflect, learn and reflect and meditate on the Dharma. It's what we need to be able to do in order to integrate it into our lives and generate realizations. The second of these five endowments is to be born in a central country or a Buddhist region. So this is an area where there are the four types of followers, Buddhist disciples, where they're active. Male and female fully ordained monastics and male and female lay followers with the five precepts. And in terms of the Vinaya, um, our text talks about a central country where the Sangha of four or more fully ordained monks or nuns lives and performs the three major Vinaya ceremonies, like what we're in now, the range retreat, the Varsa, also the invitation at the end of retreat, the Pavarna, and also the Sojang, our confession that we do every two weeks. So in the terms of Vinaya, that's how a central country is defined. Another way that to speak about a central country is it might, has two aspects. One is geographical, and this was one, this refers to actually Bogaya, which is considered like the center of the Buddhist world, a very holy place where a thousand Buddhas of the superior eon will be enlightened. And, and these Buddhas will actually survive the destruction of the eon. And we I haven't heard about that way before, but we think we hear of it more in a spiritual aspect where the, the central country is where the Buddha Dharma exists and prevails. But there's also a way that is talked about geographically. So that's the second one. The third one is to have perfect faculties, like we talked about, a healthy body and mind. And the fourth one is where they kind of differ. The sutra source call, talks about having reversible karma. That means that you haven't done, I think it's, what is the term for that? A, a non-reversible karma? or a, I don't think I'm saying that right. If you've done any of the five um, uh, deeds of immediate retribution, like killing your mother, your father, an arhat, drawing blood from a Buddha, or causing schism in, a, in the Sangha. That is a condition that uh, takes away your precious human life. In Nagarjuna, he talks about having a proper vocation. And this is like generally any kind of wrong livelihood that involves harmful activities that would cause you to turn away from the Dharma. And basically, he's, he goes on to 
explain that any physical, verbal, or mental actions that we do that are non-virtuous are a type of wrong livelihood. So with those two in mind, we can, you know, if we see that we're following a proper livelihood and we haven't done these five heinous actions, then we actually have these personal fortunes. And to, to have that, um, we need to protect. We need to protect this by not involving the mind in anything that's contrary to the Dharma and appreciate that we have this reverent mental attitude, that we have this proper kind of, of mind and thinking and heart about how we're uh, moving. So that was the fourth one. The fifth one is faith in the source, source faith in the source, which is from the Shravakabhumi. Shravakabhumi. So this means you have faith in the discipline, which is, refers to the three scriptural collections, which would be the Sutra, the Abhidharma, and the Vinaya. I think I have that right. Um, so th- those uh, scriptural sources are the source or the root of where all of the virtues that we are going to develop, that's where they come from. So you have faith in, the, in these teachings, in the three baskets, essentially. Another way of explaining this is having faith in the abode of the Dharma, the way from Nagarjuna. And this would refer to someone, if you had no faith in the Buddhist doctrine, you wouldn't even be attracted to it. So I I like the way it's explained here because it actually, the first way kind of like is kind of like explains it in a technical way, but the second one kind of in a practical way, like, Hey, if you don't believe in any of these three collections, you're really not going to have any interest in it. So you won't be attracted to the Dharma. And even so, you might have other things that you believe in. If you believe in any kind of worldly gods or whatever, or any teachings that um, posit wrong views, these aren't going to help you because they aren't going to free you from samsara or from the sufferings of the lower realm. So we have to rejoice that we are capable of turning our mind towards the Dharma, that we have this endowment of faith. So that's um, that's the fifth of those five. And then the last five are the five endowments that rest with others. And these are aspects of the uh, Dharma that pertain to others because these conditions exist in the minds of others and they are fable conditions for us to practice the teachings. And in these, the I th- not, the first five are from the Shirakabhumi, and the second five I'm assuming are still from Nagarjuna, but it's not completely clear in the text. And the first four are pretty much the same, and the fifth is pretty different, I would say. It's, I don't know. It's, yeah. I think uh, when we get there, I, I'll explain that a little bit more. So in the sutra source, these five are that a Buddha has visited, that the sublime teaching is being taught, that the teachings remain, and there are those who follow it, and there is caring for others. Nagarjuna writes, uh, explains it as the, his verse is actually, as the Buddha appears, he preaches the Dharma, the Dharma abides, the Dharma is followed, and the kindness of a guru who has compassion for others is found. But I'm not sure, like in that last one, the kindness of a guru was inserted. So I'm not sure if maybe that's the difference because that's in brackets here. So I'm not sure in that book who inserted that. Um, So maybe that's where they differ. People had different ideas about that one. Anyway, we have to depend on others for these five. So The first one is that the Buddha appears. So this is to be born in an enlightened eon. Eon is a time measurement where there's the formation, the subsistence, the destruction, and the disappearance of a universe. And an eon, when the Buddha comes into the world, is called an enlightened eon. And if no Buddha comes, it's called a dark eon. So if you weren't born in an enlightened eon when the Buddha has visited the world, you won't hear the word dharma, you won't hear the word the three jewels, all of that you will just never hear. 
So we have to rejoice that we don't have that situation where we have been born in Eon when the Buddha has appeared. So we have this special endowment of the teacher, the Buddha. And also, Pata Rinpoche explains that, and I think I've heard this before, but I don't know, he explains that the Vajrayana teachings, the Tantric Buddhism, only rarely appears. He says it only appears in three eons. Only three eons will contain suitable beings. And we are in one of those eons. So we should rejoice in that as well and take advantage of it. Uh, the second of these five is that the sublime teaching is being taught. So this means that the Buddha has taught and that disciples of the Buddha are imparting the teaching. And when His Holiness explains this, um, he explains that the Buddha has taught and is still teaching the Dharma. And technically we don't have that. The Buddha isn't still teaching. But he says it suffices that we have qualified spiritual mentors who give the teachings of the Buddha. So he says that fulfills these two conditions that the Buddha has taught and is still teaching. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Nagarja. When he explains this, he says he preaches the Dharma. So a Buddha, if they visit the world, but they don't teach the Dharma, then you can't benefit from it. So, you know, they may come, but if they choose to sit in meditation and not teach, then there's no light of the Dharma. And so that eon is really the same for us as a dark eon, because it's you're essentially lacking the teachings of the Buddha. And you know, when the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, I could try to find a different translation of this, but I couldn't find one, so I'll just use what I found. He said, deep, peaceful, unshaped, luminous, uncompounded. Ambrosia-like dharma I have found. No one to whom I teach will understand it. Without speaking, I will remain in the forest. And he stayed for seven weeks and didn't teach for the first seven weeks after being awakened. So apparently Indra and Brahma beseeched him to turn the wheel of dharma. And there's different ways that you can interpret that teaching and that, um, but in the Pali Canon, I think that's probably how they would say it. I'm not sure if Mahayanas might say he was showing the aspect or something, I don't know. But anyway, he did teach. And so we, and we still have spiritual teachers who know the Dharma, who study it, who uh, embody it. And so um, without that, sentient beings couldn't be benefited. And this situation actually came up in Tibet at the time of Atisha. Uh, there, there's a story of, um, this is one story I'm going to share because it kind of fit in. Dharma Swami Smritijana. Smritijana. He was from India and he visited Tibet. He wanted to help his mother. He saw that she had taken rebirth in one of the hell realms, the indeterminate hell. And on his way to Tibet, his interpreter died. And Smriti Jana ended up wandering all over Kham. And he didn't speak the language, so he had to work as a, even as a shepherd. And, bef and he actually couldn't bring any benefit to anyone before he died. And then Atisha visited Tibet later and heard this story. So I guess it was after that that he came. And he said, alas, you Tibetans are unfortunate. Both in Eastern and Western India, there are none among the Panditas greater than Smirti Jana. And he folded his hands to show respect and wept. <laughs> so that would be a situation where there's a teacher, qualified teacher, but we don't have the opportunity to receive teachings from them. So this one is, uh, we're in the situation where the Buddha has taught the Dharma and we still have the teachings. We still have people who teach the teachings. We still have the three baskets of the teachings. So we have this endowment. Then the third one is that the teaching remains, which means it's not degenerating. And this one is a little technical for me in our book. 
between the time of someone becoming a Buddha and giving the teaching until this Buddha passes into final nirvana. He has to teach then. The teachings have to remain. They have to not degenerate, I guess. Basically, um, yeah, I, didn't, I don't quite understand that part. I think that's the technicality of the Buddha isn't here anymore, but we still, because we have teachers, we fulfill the conditions. I think that's how that works. And so our text does say that um, we still have followers who achieve the results. And why do they achieve the results? Because they've actually generated realizations of, of um, essentially, I would say, emptiness. So, so th- this is a time when the teachings are, exist and they're still flourishing. So the transmitted dharma, which is like the oral tradition, of the three baskets still exists and is still propagated. And then there's still the realized Dharma. People have true cessations and true map, true paths in their mind stream. So this means that it's a living tradition where we have spiritual mentors who can teach us verbally and also teach us through their example. So if the if the Dharma was to disappear, then we couldn't benefit. And that would be actually the same as a dark eon, essentially. I mean, that's what it would boil down to if the Dharma disappeared, if its, if its time span had come to an end. It's said that we are in the period of the five degenerations. These are decreasing lifespan, increasing perversity and in doctrinal views, like wrong views, increase delusion, decrease quality of beings, and degeneration of the eon. But even though we're, we have these five degenerations at this time, we still have the, both the um, transmitted and the realized dharma. Those are still existing. So, you know, think about just this year and what's been going on. It feels a little degenerate in some ways. <laughs> But even amidst that, if you kind of think about your precious human life, you won't get stuck like, like His Holiness and Venerable tell us at the very beginning of just letting your mind dwell on all the negativity. Because if you, if you think about actually the good things you have going for you, it will, it will, it's very inspiring. You know, I've, I have found this is kind of my experience in this last period of time, a lot going on. And we can still appreciate everything that we have. I used to tell myself, back pain isn't one of the lists. It's not on the list for exiting you from a precious human life. (laughs) That's my joke to myself. So, So, you know, if we have, we may have physical problems, we may have things that we have to contend with. But if you look at the list, those aren't on that list. So, you know, don't, don't, don't let it, um, I don't know, when I think about my back, for instance, it's something I've had to deal with for hmm, a lot since I was 29. So however many years that is, almost 40 years. Um, I always think, you know, it's really just this big. It's only that much of my body, and I have the whole rest of the body is pretty good. So I kind of keep it in perspective that way. But this is even a bigger perspective. You know, like we have all these 18 conditions. Don't let you know, your problems drag you down. So we need to appreciate, like for this particular one, that that, uh, we still have the endowment of being born when the Dharma still abides. We're still, the Dharma is still here. The the time span of the Dharma has completed. So that was the third one. The fourth one is there are those who follow this teaching. So it's a living tradition. There are people who understand the teachings, the alt, the, you know, the ultimate sublime teachings, and they have the the capacity um, to understand them. Uh, They, they, let's see, let me say this again. There are people who understand the profundity of the Dharma, meaning they have the wisdom side, and, and really both. And they understand that we have the capacity as well. So the sages are actually following the teachings and they're willing to teach others because they see our potential. And that's what makes the Buddha Dharma a living tradition. 
So they're, if they've embraced it, and because they've embraced it, we can benefit. If, if others, if there weren't anyone, if there were no people who, if there were no sages, no people practicing, no people generating realizations and guiding us, we wouldn't be able to benefit. So we need to embrace it or cultivate as well by observing and following their example and realize that we have this situation. We have the good fortune of others. We have this endowment. So that's, and the last one is where there's quite a difference. Um, There is caring for others. And in our text, this relates to benefactors and those who actually carry out acts of charity uh, by, by providing essentially the four requisites of the four monastic, the four requisites are food, shelter, medicine, clothing. Food, shelter, clothing, medicine. That's the order, food, shelter, clothing, medicine. So we need those things in order to be able to practice. You can't, you can't practice the Dharma if you're spending all your time trying to deal with your living conditions and getting food and clothes and everything and you know taking care of yourself. You have to have certain conditions to be able to practice, and those are the four. So in that sense, we have this caring. Um, we have benefactors who support us, who support the Dharma, and we benefit from that. And Venerable His Holiness says that if people haven't thought about re- rebirth very much, oh, you know, actually, let me go through that other one first. Sorry. The other way this was explained is um, is kind of interesting. We have time for it. I kind of exited it out because I thought we wouldn't have time, but we do. So the, the fifth one is explained in Nagarjan as the kindness of a guru who has compassion for others. So here it's explained, and this is Pacho Rinpoche teaching, and he's teaching, this isn't from words of my perfect teacher, but he is teaching what his teacher taught him in the book, that, in this text. Um, he's saying that oh, although we as students might uh, embrace the Dharma, if we don't have a spiritual mentor, we actually can't understand the essence of the Dharma. It's essential to have a spiritual mentor. We have to be helped by a guide and their extraordinary compassion for us. And so this is, um, this is Pacho Rinpoche's uh, text now. He's saying that if you're not led by a spiritual teacher, even entering the Dharma won't help. In what sense won't it help? Actually, you, I'm sure you can do many good things for your life, just like secular, the secularization of Buddhism has many things that are uh, very beneficial to people, but it's not gonna free you some, from samsara. And so we have to have certain conditions. And um, the, so it, it is necessary to have a spiritual mentor. And when Atisha came to Tibet, he had these three followers. Uh, one of them was Nock, who we've heard about from Guy Newland a lot. Drome, Drome, Drome Topa, we've heard about. And the other was Ku. And they asked him, for a person to attain Buddhahood, which is more important? following the main teachings of the Kangir and the Tengir or following the instructions of the teacher. And Atisha said that the guru's instructions are more important. And then they asked, well, why is that? Why is that so? And, and Atisha said, although one may be able to recite the whole, all of the Dharma, the Tripitaka, you know, just all of it from memory and may know all these expositions of the Dharma, if you don't have any practical experience with the, the teacher's instructions, you'll stray from the proper path. And if he continued on to say, if the, if the teacher's instructions or the guru's instructions are summed up, which is better? Oh yeah, no, this is them asking again. So then these three asked, if the guru's instructions are summed up, which is better, to abide by three moral precepts or to engage one's body, speech, and mind in meritorious work? And he said, those wouldn't be of much benefit. 
<laughs> and why? So they asked why. And they said, even if, he, Atisha said, even if one abides in the three vows and practices purification, if one's, I think the three vows must be the pratimoksha, the bodhisattva, and the tantric vows. So, and, and practices purification, which would be the part where he said, where they asked about uh, engage one's body, speech, and mind, meritorious work. If one's mind is not withdrawn from the three realms of samsara, such activity will cause re-entry into samsara. So, although we may control our body, speech, and mind and do very meritorious activities day and night, if we don't dedicate the merit for the attainment of Buddhahood, any thought contrary to the Dharma will easily wash away your stock of merit. <laughs> That's the way they translated this. So basically what it comes down to is what's next in the chapter is if you can't turn your mind away from the eight worldly concerns, then you're not actually going to make progress. So whatever you'll do, you'll be doing for this life, for this world, and you won't find liberation. So that's the whole kind of the gist of what Atisha was saying there, which is the in this chapter, after they go through uh, more about precious human life, the next topic is the eight worldly concerns, which is, is what takes us away. And the eight worldly concerns, actually, let me list them because it's not good to bring something up and not say anything about it. Hmm. I, like, I want to do it the shortest way possible. So there's eight thing, eight, uh, eight worldly concerns, two sets of four. Four things we're quite attached to and four things that we're averse to. Gain and loss. We, we are attached to gain and we are averse to loss. Praise and blame. We are attached to praise and we are averse to blame or censure. We have attachment to fame or status and we have aversion for being disgraced or in disrepute being insignificant. And then we have attachment to pleasure and we have aversion to pain, especially with our five senses. So that's kind of, if you're living in that, driven by the, blown around by the eight world of concerns, you're just kind of stuck with this life and you aren't, you aren't actually practicing the Dharma. So those are the five. And then His Holiness says about these, um, freedoms and fortunes. Actually, if a person doesn't think about rebirth much, they actually won't really be able to clearly ascertain these freedoms and fortunes. You have to actually, they, they kind of depend on thinking about rebirth. But he kindly goes through some points that are common that everyone could agree on. Like we have life stories and we have the sutras and we have treaties. We have the um, the sutras that come from Shakyamuni Buddha. We have the treaties that come from Nagarjuna. We have all these beautiful texts from Shantideva and all the great masters. And their ethical conduct was pure. They have meditative experience. They have wisdom and they have great humility. And we can all, we all know that from both reading the canon, reading their teachings, hearing about their life stories. They didn't actually become renowned by becoming like generals or financial wizards or presidents of countries or, you know, they lived a life that was very restrained, one that was very humble, and they benefited others. And we can see this, that we can, we can see this for ourselves through reading the sutras, reading the treaties, reading the life stories. So we have role models. And the point here of this, what His Holiness is getting to is that the point of him bringing this up is that if you look at the nature of our precious human life and the nature of their precious human life, including Shakyamuni Buddha, there's actually not much difference. We, everyone, all, we all have the same human potential. And compared to any other life forms, we have a very unique kind of intelligence. So, and we all have the Buddha nature. So we have to appreciate that. We have to use that as an inspiration. As His Holiness says, he's 
learned from meeting uh, Westerners that oftentimes we have low self-esteem or self-hatred, which are distorted conceptions. But if we were to respect, reflect properly on our precious human life, the fortune that we have, that would actually undermine low self-esteem and self-hatred. He actually says that it's obvious that we are worthwhile and adequate people because we have these eight freedoms and ten fortunes. To him it's obvious. And I think it would be to us if we spent more time with the topic. And the reason I say that is because also Dama Kusho said the same thing to me. She said, uh, well, to, I don't know. I don't know if she said it to me personally. It could have been in a teaching. But it, whatever, it's all the same. She said, if you take hold of your precious human re rebirth, you can never be depressed. It's not possible to have depression. So to have these eight con 18 conditions that we've been talking about, it takes a lot of good karma. We've had a lot of really constructive karma in previous lives to have our present opportunity that allows us to practice and allows us to have the capacity to practice the Dharma. So we have actually all the conditions we need. So to have the, seeing our future as bleak, even given all the things that are going on this year, that's actually unrealistic. So we need to con have consistent, His Holiness says we should have consistent meditation on the precious human life so we can get rid of any kind of self-defeating or inaccurate ways of viewing ourselves and then to generate the kind of enthusiasm that we need. And this reminded me of um, something that Kinsler Jampa Tektrok said. Because, you know, it's, if we, if we t like when Damakusha said, you know, taking the essence of a precious human life, I think she means that we understand like the rarity of it and the difficulty of attaining it. And so if we really take that to heart, then we see that we have kind of an amazing situation and, and our lives can't feel meaningless. And what Kinsler John Patekchok said is that, I think he was, we were having maybe, he was teaching on Nagarjuna, so there was a lot going on around emptiness and the view of the self and everything. And so I think he was saying, um, it was in reference to the self, and he was saying, it's not who you are that's important, it's what you can do with your life. And we're kind of stuck in who I am, <laughs> you know, like our respect, like, like where we started with uh, Chandrakirti. First with the thought, I, they cling to a self. Then with the thought, mine, they become attached to things. That's us. That's me. You know, and this is what uh, Kinder John Chektrup was kind of like trying to get into us. You know, un we undermine that. That's not what's important. It's not who we are that's important. It's what we can do with this life. So, Yeah. For you, all those people who like to do things, <laughs> we're in a good situation. And um, I don't have any more. I have more, but I don't have more that I'm going to share. If anyone has any questions or comments, <laughs> I have a few other things that were fun, but I, I might not be able to pull them off too well. Because, you know, we have all these stories about like the turtle coming up, and there's, <laughs> there's one where, oh, uh, there was one where like they throw beans onto a wall, and you're, you're, you're having a precious human life is as common as the beans sticking to a wall, or one where they take mustard seeds and they dump them on a pin. Having a precious human life is, is, like, is as likely as a mustard seed sticking to a pin. <laughs> I thought the, the rarity and all that, I thought those were pretty good, but I didn't, I didn't prepare those too much because I, I thought I'd run out of time. But does anyone have any questions or comments before we... Close. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. I think one of the things that I don't think about enough is that I was born into this life with just a human life, and then this incredible karma ripened, and now I have a precious human life. Mm -hmm. And I have to make sure and understand that that's not guaranteed either. Right. Whether something happens to me where I lose my cognit cognitive abilities or some crazy affliction arises to where I just head down the road and just walk away from the Dharma. Yeah. So there's this, when I look at it, I, I, I 
keep trying to remember that this is something that I garnered pretty much halfway through my life and that I can't get too complacent about having some, and if you only lose one of those freedoms and fortunes, it can really change everything. Yeah, I think you need all of them. <laughs> huh? I think we need all, all of them. them. Yeah. Not even just 17 or 16, right. you need 18 of them. Right, yeah. And I want to echo what you said. I think that we've been so well taught with Venable Children, like, you know, she she is the most careful person I've ever known about protecting herself from the, the conditions she puts herself in because she strongly believes that what she says, that we've done everything and you never know what karma is going to ripen. And um, yeah, I mean, I used to even, I remember when I first, when, one of the first times I went back to Seattle, I used to go sometimes to the, they have a picnic, the Saki Monastery has a picnic on the 4th of July down at Karkik Park. And I used to always walk to Karkik Park from my house because it was like, it was kind of a nice walk. I think round trip, it was maybe two and a half miles or something. And I would walk from my house down to the beach and sometimes walk on the beach when the tide was out and then walk home. And when I went to that, that time, I got a ride there. Somebody dropped me off and I was going to walk back to my friend's house. And I started walking out of there and I realized I shouldn't be walking alone through this park. You know, I never thought that <laughs> on my own. But living with Venerable, I thought, no way should I be walking through this part of this park alone. And I had a friend give me a ride. Because there's a part of that park where it's kind of, um, there's a long stretch where it's kind of a little desolate for a very urban, large city. And um, yeah, I used to wander around there all the time. And, you know, I, I just, there's so many things that I do differently now and appreciate that. So we need to, we, we need to be really um, careful. We don't know. Yeah. I like the point about how um, the second set of the fortunes, the five fortunes, it has to do with other people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not just our own karma that will get us to awakening. We have to think about creating the conditions where we can practice in the future, and that means helping other people, too. Yeah. We can't do it alone. Yeah. Yeah. So I hadn't thought about that in terms of what are the karma to have these, you know, like how do these come about? I don't have to think about it again in that way. That's a very good point. Yeah. Yes. Two questions online. The first one is, what can one do if you feel disappointed by your spiritual mentor? I guess this is in the context of when you're talking about how one of the five conditions is um, being cared for or really relating to the spiritual mentor. Is it, repeat the question as it's written again. What can one do if you feel disappointed by the spiritual mentor? I think what I would suggest is first examine the qualities of a student and figure out if you're deluded or not <laughs> in what you're thinking and seeing. I mean, I'm just talking from personal experience here. Um, if I'm understanding the question right, to be disappointed in your spiritual mentor, is it valid or not valid? You know, that's the first question that comes to mind for me. So am I seeing them properly or am I seeing them in delusion? I, or could you be disappointed because you wanted more from them? I don't know what. I mean, that comes up for us a lot. That's why I wanted to go through that first part. Because I think when Pato Rinpoche says that, he always cuts right to the chase. And if you read in this series that we're studying right now, I don't remember which book it's in, but it might be this book, the, the part where they explain about the spiritual mentor. It's so clear in there about, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, it takes a long time to really learn how to be a proper student. I'm just speaking from my own experience on this certain aspect. To be disappointed, for me to be disappointed in the teacher, when I've seen that in my mind, it's because I'm holding things wrong. My expectations are not in line with what a spiritual mentor is all about. So, I mean, I don't know the details. It'd be hard to know, but I can just go off my own experience of both sitting in teachings, 
having my mind be deluded, going and listening to him later and realize, wow, that didn't sound anything like what my mind was taking it in as at the time. So I know I'm deluded and my even, you know, it appears to me, you know, like I was, you know, can, it, because the Dharma is so challenging, we get kind of triggered and pushed sometimes because you're swimming upstream. So I don't know, I don't know this person's situation, that, but I can say from most people I know that having a spiritual mentor is a, it comes in the beginning in the Lam Rim, but for Westerners, Venerable doesn't teach it first because we need a lot more of the Buddhist worldview first and a lot of background. And it's kind of feels complicated in a way. I mean, it takes a long time, I think, to kind of sort out like, what is this relationship properly? How, what is, what is it supposed to be? It's not supposed to be like what Pacha Rinpoche said, where they're going to like wave a magic wand and whisk you off to liberation. It's not going to be like, like it is in Christianity where, where God just calls you to heaven or however it works. It's not going to be like a parent who protects you from harm, like a young child. It's really going to be one where they guide you. And sometimes the guidance is, is to let you figure it out for yourself. <laughs> so I don't know. It's hard to know what the situation is. It's a very difficult question to answer because there could be a lot of things going on, but maybe that will give the person something to think about. And I don't know if anyone here has anything to add. Because it's hard. I th I'm not sure. If yeah, I'm it, it is a personal situation, so it's it's really hard to address directly. And, and disappointment can arise for many, 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 many different things. Um, but what's also um, a responsibility of the student is having checked out the teacher very, very carefully before you enter into the relationship. And the more diligent we are as students to be aware of that and to check out the qualities of the teacher, um, the more clear. If we come to a place of being disappointed in the teacher, we can really look to our own mind, unless there's ethical breach Breaches. that you didn't expect. Right. So, but that's also part of our job is to check the qualities of the teacher. Right. And if there is an ethical breach on the side of the teacher, His Holiness has taught about this, and Venable has taught from his teachings to us numerous times. You 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 may have to gracefully, respectfully back away from a teacher who is being unethical, clearly unethical and important matters. But you never let go of the, the proper teachings that they taught you, and you can hold appreciation for them for what they have taught you. Because they actually, you know, people aren't usually all good or all, all bad, and it may be that there are, uh, ask, if, if they taught you the, the Dharma properly, you want to hold on to that and hold them with respect, even though you might hold them, you might be from a distance and you might not follow them even anymore. But you wouldn't, um, yeah, you don't disparage your a spiritual mentor, even if they can't be your teacher anymore. Is there a second question? Someone else asks, what can be considered a view that is contrary to the Dharma that would make one not receptive to the Dharma? With many, with many new views about mindfulness out now, this isn't very clear. So um, I think they were talking about views that were based on wrong views that would make your mind unreceptive. Mindfulness isn't really contrary to the Dharma. It's just how, peop how people, are, people are teaching it for different reasons. So in a secular or psychological model, they're teaching it for psychological health, stress reduction, pain reduction. It's all for this life. In a Buddhist context, they're teaching mindfulness for um, liberation and, you know, and then awakening, actually. Um, so Mindful, there's nothing really wrong with mindfulness. But the kind of thing that would take you away would be more of a kind of either the way it was explained, I realized while I was teaching it that it was laid out for both innate and acquired views. We come in with some things that are innate, and if you, if you get those shored up <laughs> uh, in any way, 
that could be a problem. Like the one, the example they gave in the text was like eternalism and nihilism. If you if you actually believe something like, actually, uh, I remember my brother saying once that I can't remember if he said he believed in chaos theory. You know, that for him that kind of explained everything because things were so hard to explain that let's just believe in chaos. I mean, like if you can't posit, if you can't posit like um, cause and effect. You know, if there's certain kind of basic things that are like the fundamentals of the Buddhist worldview that you cannot subscribe to, like cause and effect, karma, things like that, especially cause and effect, I would say more generally, you know, um, that would be difficult. (laughs) Because we're saying, or if you believe, say, that you're inherently evil, like if you don't believe that the mind stream is that the afflictions are adventitious, and you believe they're part and parcel of the mind and they can't be separated, well, right then and there, you could never get out of samsara because your mind, you would, you know, your, well, your mind actually, we don't believe it's like that, but if you had that belief, you wouldn't do the practices that would clean up these afflictions because why would you bother? You can't get rid of them, you know? So I think I remember learning once, I think, I can't remember if it was Guy who was explaining this, or I think it was actually Dorji, Geshe Dorji Damdo. Like in Hinduism, you know, they have the Atman, and it's actually very um, appealing in a certain way because you can say, well, the mind doesn't go on, and my mind's it's corrupt, you know, it's like got so many negativities in it, and the body. It's just going to decay. It doesn't go on, but the Atman goes on. So you have this beautiful thing that goes on, and you can kind of just, you know, it just goes on, and and you don't have to deal with, you know, you don't have the idea of kind of cleaning the mind up in the way that a Buddhist would. So those kind of views would, wouldn't would really bode so well, I don't think. I think they, they are considered wrong views, actually, to think that the we're inherently evil for instance. Inherently means it can't be separated out. That's a wrong view. And if you had that kind of view, it would get in the way. Big time. (laughs) I mean, you might start with that view, but, you know, the one thing I wanted to say that this reminds me of is, uh, I remember that, okay, I was the closet Buddhist who just read books and wouldn't go to any religious institutions until 2000 because... They all look good on paper, but <laughs> I just didn't want anything to do with organized religion until then. It took me a while to get over that. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't have started like that. Because I don't know, it made me forget my point. <laughs> oh, it's so gone. Okay, what were we talking about? <laughs> yeah, right. Mm. Okay, it's getting late. I don't think it's, it will come back, but it won't come back before we're going to end this evening. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. That's true. Okay, so I, yeah, I don't know. Let's let that go. I can't bring it back. Oh, yeah, okay, I remember now. That's what it was. Okay, so then I finally go to a place. And the first book I read was by Damakusho's uncle, Dacian Rinpoche. Three Levels of Spiritual Perception, I think is the title. It's the kind of the sutra teachings in the Sakya school. And the thing, there were a couple things in there that really struck me. One was that you need instruction to meditate. You should not do serious meditation without proper instruction, or you'll end up like those prairie dogs (laughs) where you look like you're meditating, but your mind is blank. And the other was that Dasha Rinpoche was so emphatic about his own practice. He said, I never rejected any part of the Dharma. And, and this is a thing that Venerable Children taught us early on here. Like, we're swimming upstream. A lot of things are hard to grok. And, and we're not even ready for a lot of them. So some of those things you actually need to just set on the back burner and focus your practice on the things that are where you're at. But the thing is, is just set them aside. Don't reject them. 
the problem with rejecting those things is if you actually have any sense that you might be deluded, and I'm clear I am, that's what makes me clear on this, I shouldn't reject those things because I just am too deluded to understand them at this time. I can just set them aside. And then as my mind gets more clear, there'll come a place where some of these things, and it's happened already, they make more sense. I have more receptivity. My mind is more open. If I was to reject those things, I've now set up a barrier. And that's a problem. So we're, you know, at some point, once you decide to become a Buddhist, there comes a place where at least, even early on, I think you should be careful. You know, you don't have to buy it. You don't have to believe them. You don't have to believe this, but you also shouldn't reject it. Just set it on the back burner and focus on the parts of the practice that relate to your life, that make sense, that you understand, and that you can do properly. That's important. Deshana Rinpoche convinced me of that. (laughs) 